De Rispapa Alpha 0 Eco Tango Eco voor de Daily Minutes nummer 1417 met een uitzending voor vandaag 23 september 2018. Dus de bulletin van zondag. Ik heb vandaag geen data, daar was helaas geen tijd voor. Ik had nogal wat computerproblemen met YouTube, dat werkt niet altijd even goed moet ik zeggen. Um, maar goed, dat er zeide, er was vandaag ook geen ARL audio nieuws. ARL audio nieuws, dat was er dus niet. En ik heb dat vervangen door een column van de Onno die we nog niet gehad hadden, een heel recente. The remainder of this bulletin will be in English. Ik ben Onno van de podcast Foundations of Amateur Radio in Australië. En je luistert nu naar de Daily Minutes van Papa Alpha Zero Echo Tango Echo. I'm Ono of the Foundations of Amateur Radio podcast in Australia, and you're listening to the Daily Minutes by Papa Alpha Zero Echo Tango Echo. Foundations of Amateur Radio The first time I came across the concept of antenna polarization was a decade before I became a radio amateur. To connect to the internet while driving around Australia, I became the proud owner of a portable satellite dish. Portable in the broadest sense of the word, 150 kilos with a dish that's 2.4 meters high, 1.8 meters wide, steel base, electronics, power and patience to erect, and point. The dish has a receiver and transmitter component that needs to be aligned, just so, in order to be able to have two-way communications using 5 watts into geosynchronous orbit. The transmit and receive are exactly 90 degrees offset from each other. One is called horizontal polarization, the other vertical. The first thing to observe is that if you're using the wrong polarization, it doesn't really work well. We'll get into what is right in a moment. Depending on where you ask, the definition of not working well can be as bad as 40 dB loss. Just let that sink in for a moment. If you want to punch through with more power, you'll need to bring 10 kilowatt with you for the receiving station with the opposite polarization to hear 1 watt. If you're using a VHF or UHFM radio in your car, you're likely to have a vertical antenna. The combination of a repeater on a hill and a radio in a car adds up to much more than the two alone. The line is blurred today because repeaters are very popular and home base stations are becoming smaller and smaller by the week. So vertical antennas for VHF and UHF at home are today just as common as they are on cars. It wasn't always that way. In fact, in HF it's almost never that way. And if you're a fan of tropospheric ducting or long-distance VHF, then you'll also shy away from vertical antennas. Let me explain. If you want to erect a HF antenna and you want it to rotate and you want it to be high enough off the ground, you'll build the simplest mast you can get away with. Imagine a HF Yagi. It's got several elements, long to short along a boom, rotator somewhere in the middle. If you mount this Yagi horizontally, your mast will be around half a wavelength in height. If you mount the same Yagi vertically, aside from the height discussion, should it be mounted higher or not, now your mast becomes another interfering element within your Yagi. The steel wires that keep your mast standing will also interfere with the Yagi elements, and your elements will be closer to the ground where they can potentially cause harmful radiation. So from a mechanical perspective, putting a Yagi on a mast vertically is not trivial. From a radiation perspective, you may theoretically get some gain, but adding an element or two will make up for any potential gain that a vertical arrangement interacting with Earth might assist with. There's another reason. The ionosphere. It sounds like a smooth billiard ball. It's drawn as a uniform layer around the Earth, but in reality, clouds and their appearance are much more likely to represent the actual surface shapes that the ionosphere represents to your radio waves. A signal coming in one way is unlikely to come out the other end in the same way, and vice versa. That's HF. On VHF and UHF, a horizontal signal and a vertical signal, when they're used with line of sight, are pretty similar. But once you get beyond that, a horizontal signal will travel further. How exactly is a story for another day. If you're doing point-to-point VHF or UHF contesting, horizontal is the way to go. What about a single HF vertical? It's excellent for a portable station. It's simple to set up, works in all directions, but it means you'll be able to hear all the local man-made noise as well. So find a quiet spot near the beach if you can. So what's the right way? Almost always horizontal, except on cars or when you're on a de-expedition on a beach sipping pina colada and getting caught in the rain. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha, Bravo. 
Foundations of Amateur Radio. Morse code is a way of communicating with people across the globe using dits and dars and the spaces between them to convey a message. It's no longer required to get an amateur license, but that doesn't mean that it's not useful. In fact, far from it. Morse is still heavily used in this hobby. I've been attempting to learn Morse code for quite some time. To do this, I was told time and time again, over and over, ad nauseum, that Morse is an auditory language. I was told that the way to success was to listen before sending, to be able to decode before ever touching a key, and to learn with tapes. I also was told that if I learned it slowly, I'd run into trouble later on, when I wanted to hear a beacon, which identifies itself with much faster Morse code. Morse is an interesting phenomenon. We describe it in words in day-to-day -day terminology as having dots and dashes, which is how the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, defines it. But I have been assured that I should think of it in terms of dits and dars, because that more closely mimics the sound of the language, and from my current experience, I have to agree. This is an audio language, and it's defined in terms of how long a dit takes to transmit. A dit is one time unit. A dar is three dits. The space between a dit and a dar within one letter is one dit. The space between two letters is three dits, and the space between two words is seven dits. I'm not expecting you to learn that right here and now, just pointing out that there is a definition of how this is supposed to work. If you make a dit last longer, everything else lasts longer, so determining how fast you're sending something is not simple to do unless there's a standard. Of course, there's a standard. The way that the speed in Morse is defined is by counting how many times a standard word can be sent per minute. The Paris standard uses the word Paris because it is precisely 50 dits in terms of timing. There's another word, Codex, which has 60 dits. So the two words per minute are different depending on which standard you use. And to make things even more interesting, some people measure with five dits between words, where the ITU specifies seven dits between words. So speed is variable depending on who's measuring. The ITU doesn't specify which is right, but it gets better. As I said, this is an audio language, so you need to listen to it to learn it. Over the years, it's been hammered into me, don't write Morse, don't use dits and dars, listen, listen, listen. I did. At 25 words per minute, at whatever standard that was calculated, I can now hear Morse. That is, I can detect the gaps between letters and words and I can hear the rhythm of the code. Great. So I'm done, right? Not so fast. While I can hear the individual letters, I still don't actually know what a G sounds like or what makes the letter X, or an open parenthesis, or a question mark. Easy. Look them up. Learn the sound. Done. Morse code is a standard, right? Right? Seriously, Morse code is a standard, right? No. Not so much. Not even a little bit. If you search the globe for Morse code charts, so you can look up a question mark, you'll end up with hundreds of different charts. Everyone agrees the letter A, or alpha, is dida, but they cannot even agree that N, November, is dadit. Some show the difference between an open and a closed parentheses. Others use the same character. There's charts that put dits and dars inside the letters of the alphabet, but don't specify in which order the parts are heard. The Wireless Institute of Australia doesn't even appear to bother specifying. The Fists Down Under Morse Preservation Society doesn't show a copy. The ARRL has an abomination on their website that you cannot even link to. The ACMA defines the end of transmission as a cross, and then there are the special ones. Survival charts and PowerPoint slides and using words to describe a symbol. So you can know that a fraction bar is da did it da dit but you don't actually know what it looks like. You'll be pleased to learn that the ITU actually publishes a document, ITU-RM.1677-1, last updated in October of 2009. 
that specifies the International Morse Code. It goes into great detail on what characters are defined, how to start and stop transmissions, how to transmit things like percentages, what to do if you need to send a multiplication symbol, inverted commas, minutes and second signs, fractions, and as a bonus, it has the phrase that this document, and I quote, should be used to define the Morse code characters and their applications in the radio communication services. Nothing quite like a standard that should be adopted rather than must be adopted. The ITU also tells us that, quote, the code needs to be updated from time to time to meet the needs of the radio communication services. The French word arobas, which in English is pronounced at and looks like the letter A with a circle, used today in an email address, was added to Morse code in 2002 by the French General Committee on Terminology. Quick off the mark for a symbol that appeared on a typewriter in 1889 and first used in an email address in 1971, but if you look for an exclamation mark, an ampersand, a dollar symbol, a semicolon or an underscore, you won't find anything about it in the ITU standard. Oh, here's a fun fact. The ITU document says, quote, No part of this publication may be reproduced by any means whatsoever without written permission of the ITU, end quote. So apparently I can't actually tell you that a did it did da did da means that this is the end of my transmission. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha, Bravo. Deze middels zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren via PI2 NOS. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Alle mail is welkom op het adres x xdvme Dat is ook te vinden rechts boven aan de webpagina van de uitzending www.pa0ete.nl. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De Daily Minutes komt tot stand mede dankzij de stichting Scope Hobbyfonds. Dit is Papa Alpha 0 Echo Tango Echo. En microfoon naar retour.